Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. It is a brand new year of Lincoln-Douglas debate here in 2022-23. Brand new year of debate for everybody. And we, as always, here at Hell State Debate are here to help you out uh, with the first topic of the fall for September and October in Lincoln-Douglas debate, which is a classic, really, kind of an, uh, which I guess you'd say an oldie but a goodie. Uh, the United States ought to implement a single-payer universal health care system. So if you're new to the channel, or maybe if you're just new to debate, uh, Hell State Debate is a channel devoted to making debate accessible and fun for everybody. Uh, we're kind of here to try to help people have access to sort of the coaching that maybe not everybody gets if you're not part of a big program. Uh, and we just want it to be fun and informative. We kind of err on the side of, of quality, maybe over like speed and quantity. So hopefully uh, you will dig some of our arguments and they will be useful to you. Uh, it is an interesting topic. Luke, uh, uh, Luke Cheney is representing the team here today. He's gonna be our new co-host on the LD side of things. So Luke, welcome. Thank you. Thank um, you. And so Luke, since you're new, uh, a recent former high school debater, a policy debater, but making the transition to LD, uh, tell me, on a scale of one to 10, how do you rate the resolution? Well, as a former policy debater, I'd probably give it a <laughs> nine out of 10. Yeah, but I really love topics like this that are just super policy heavy to where I can just kind of relive the good old days. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, it, it, one of the things I'm gonna say in just a second is it is very much like a policy topic, so I figured you would like it, so fantastic. Um, so anyway, really quickly at MSU, we have a great team, including Luke. Luke's one of the top 10 in the country in his division last year, really lucky to have him here. Got a really good team that focuses on IPDA debate. If you wanna learn more about us, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and we'll put all of our links to all the socials uh, in the descriptions below. Uh, as always, uh, we will put all of the sources we cite in the description below because we want it to be useful to you. If it is useful, you know, maybe like, maybe subscribe, uh, maybe tell a friend. And so with that, uh, just to keep us rolling, because we have a ton to cover on this topic, uh, let's jump right into our initial thoughts. So I'll go first on this one and then you can do yours. So uh, my first thought, as Luke points out, is it is very much like a policy topic. It is a policy heavy topic because it's an area in which the details and the particulars and the data really matter. Um, there's not, frankly, a ton of room for, I think, a, a great deal of creativity on like philosophy and sort of, sort of moral level stuff, but there is some room. And we're gonna spend some time during the video talking about how you can try to transition this to make it a little bit less of a pure policy topic and a little bit more of a true LD topic. So maybe in my book, as, as as an, as an LD fan, as a Lincoln Douglas debate value fan, maybe not ideal, but I really do think that we can make it work with some effort if you want to sort of transition it away from sort of a pure utilitarian analysis. Uh, I guess the second point I have is very closely related, which is that it is most definitely, no matter what you do, like no matter what framing you use, no matter what value or criteria, it is very much a data and analysis driven topic. There's really no way around looking at numbers, looking at health outcomes, looking at costs, and there are just oceans of data on that. There's almost too much, there's certainly too much to cover in, in this video or any single video. So what you're gonna need, you know, at, at the end of the day, at the end of the round, is the ability to translate all of that into a plain English simple narrative, right? And that takes knowing the topic inside and out, right? That takes really having a lot of background information and being able to give the judge to process all of that information and to give them a simple narrative about what the app is accomplishing or what the neg is accomplishing and what the issues are in the debate in plain English that they can understand. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is I, I personally think the topic leans a little bit uh, AF heavy. I think it leans toward the AF and here's the reason why. There's just so much evidence out there that the status quo situation in the United States, the system that we have for healthcare, if you can even call it a system, right? It's, it's all, arguably not even a system, it's just sort of a random collection of, of things that happened historically. But the system that we have is so fundamentally broken. It is so far behind our peers in terms of costs and outcomes and equity that I, I frankly think there aren't a lot of good faith sort of policy level arguments that we maintain the status quo. And what that means is, as, as the negative, you have to be a little creative. You either have to find some sort of fundamental moral reason why, you know, we, we, we should not be making this change, uh, or, you know, pointing out some fatal flaw in single payer specifically, or maybe running a counter plan or an alternative. And those are all things that we're going to talk about later. But I do think the NEG has a little bit of an uphill battle, certainly not insurmountable. Overall, I don't know if I'd give it a nine like Luke, but I would say I think it's probably up there as a solid seven. So those are my initial thoughts. Luke, what are you thinking on this? Well, I mean, as I said, as a former policy debater, this topic is one that really gets me excited. And uh, there are some really big advantages and disadvantages depending on what side you have and how you actually write your case. 
And your advantage is the ability to use actual evidence and policies as examples in your case. But just remember not to get too caught up in the weeds and all of that, because keep in mind, even though this is a policy heavy topic, it's still Lincoln Douglas debate, right. it's not policy debate. So maybe you could use more of an ethic, ethics based argument uh, when your opponent might be expecting utilitarian argument. One of the things I'm going to say a little bit later is that I actually do think you can run a case through a lot of ethical frameworks. Like you can run it through Rawlsian justice, you can run it through Kantian ethics, you can run it through critical theory, you know, uh, systemic violence and things like that. The problem for me is that even if you run it through those, you still have to keep coming back, as we'll talk about later, to a utilitarian analysis of outcomes to explain why you achieve those things, right? So at any rate, um, so good thoughts, off to a good start, I think. We've got a lot to cover, a huge amount to cover. So without further ado, what we will do is we will go in the usual order for these videos. We will start with background and definitions, uh, then we will move on to affirmative arguments, then negative arguments, and then some final thoughts. All right, so we've got an absolute ton to cover. So let's jump right in and talk about kind of the foundations of the topic before we get to the arguments. So the background, the definitions, and then maybe just a little bit about framing like criteria, values, and things like that. So we're gonna start with sort of general factual background, right? Healthcare and healthcare reform are almost like intimidatingly complex topics. They represent, you know, massive sectors of the economy, incredibly complicated regulatory systems, even in the United States, where it's more or less laissez-faire, and also just a lot of kind of random historical happenstance of how our system came to be, right? There is no way to cover all of it in a 90-minute video, but it's still incredibly important for you as a debater to try to wrap your brain around the big picture. Not just your case and your blogs, right? But enough that you can speak from a full head, like off the cuff in the round. The idea behind knowing more than you say in debate is that you can be agile, right? You can respond in the moment with examples and illustrations and point out things off the cuff without having to sit behind a, a card or a block and read it to the judge, right? So you seem adaptable. You can say, oh, well, you mentioned that. It's funny that you said that. Isn't it true that, you know, for example, when Great Britain did this, this is what happened, right? It makes you sound adaptable. It also just makes you sound smart. It makes you sound like, you know, a grown-up, yeah. right? And uh, if I were to add, you might just remember any of those Wild West movies. The biggest, baddest cowboy was always the one with the quickest draw. So the guy who could pull his gun out the fastest. If you you can pull up the facts and information the fastest and just off the top of the dome, you're going to look really impressive and really competent in front of judges. See, that's why we like this guy. He's absolutely right. That's also what he's kind of good at in debate, right? Being able to just sort of, you know, pull it out when you need it uh, is incredibly impressive. It makes you sound like, you know, more like an adult who actually knows what they're talking about rather than, with all due respect, a teenager who's just kind of nervously reading facts. So knowing more is always your friend, even if you don't use it in a case or use it in a card. Um, so to, to get us through that, uh, what we're going to talk about first is the status quo of health coverage in the United States, what it's like. Number two, a really quick summary of alternative systems around the world, including single payer, but also including some other things. Uh, the history of U.S. attempts at single payer, because we have tried this before. And finally, some discussion of the poor performance of the U.S. healthcare system in relation to the rest of the world. Let's jump right into how health coverage works in the status quo, in the United States specifically. So the United States is actually an outlier when it comes to other developed countries and their healthcare systems. We use something called the market system or the out-of-pocket system, which is basically where if you want health care, you have to pay for it yourself directly. And of course, you can go through insurance companies who will pay a portion of it for a cost, obviously. But Compared to the rest of the world, it's really not that great. And when you say that we have a healthcare system, it's not really a system. We kind of have healthcare and it's there if you can afford it. Unlike a lot of countries that we're going to be talking about on this topic, um, we did not collectively sort of sit down and try to have a rational determination of what a fair, cost-effective way to allocate care is. Like, Great Britain did that with the National Health Service in the middle of the 20th century. Most countries sat down and tried to figure out a system, which is why we say it's a little bit charitable to call our system a system. Ours came about, honestly, more as a result of just historical accident than any rational design. And if you want a really good summary of this, we're going to link you to a somewhat 
unconventional source, but you've got to trust us on this. This is a video from um, what's called Some More News, and it's from just this past month in 2022. It's called The uh, Perverse Incentives of the Healthcare Industry. Um, now, this is a comedy uh, show. Uh, the, as you can kind of see from the slide that we're putting up here, it doesn't take itself too seriously. I'm going I'm to warn you in advance, they may use a, a, a colorful word here or two in the video. Uh, but it is just a fantastic video to watch start to finish if you want to be able to speak intelligently like a normal sort of funny person about the serious problems of the U.S. healthcare system and the status quo. You know, humor and down-to-earth delivery are way underrated in high school debate. Judges love it, but I digress. If you want to focus on just how the U.S. healthcare system evolved into the Frankenstein's monster it currently is, that starts at about 645 into the video so you can start there, right? The really, really short version is that you essentially had sort of charitable organizations that started providing uh, care plans and then you know during World War II and the depression there were restrictions on wage increases and so employers started trying to to, to lull people into working for them by by giving these health care benefits as sort of a nice bonus well this was a good way for things to start but we, we sort of got lazy and careless with it and the United States allowed employers to sort of take over you know the provision of health care to everyone so the vast majority of Americans today get their medical coverage as a result of benefits that they get from their employer right? Uh, it's mainly provided in this country through for-profit insurance companies who are in turn mainly paid by your employer, which means that in the United States, unlike in basically all of the other countries we're going to talk about, whether they're single payer or not single payer, the most direct route to having health care coverage is having a job with health insurance benefits. And if you don't have a job like that, or say if you're self-employed or you lose your job, then things get really complicated and really expensive, right? Now on top of this Wild West system where medical care is provided by your employer, the U.S. absolutely has layered some piecemeal efforts to expand coverage to more people, right? So some of these, like Medicare and Medicaid, are very similar to single payer. So Medicaid provides coverage to lower income people and Medicare is for older Americans, typically over 65. So it's important to remember, especially if you know, a negative debater is telling you horror stories about how bad single payer systems are, that the United States already has has multiple single payer systems or at least systems that are very similar to single payer in the status quo like Medicare, Medicaid and also the Veterans Administration. And as you can see here, we have this handy chart from 2017 summarizing where Americans actually get their health coverage. And as you can see, about 100 million Americans, if you add it all up, are receiving their care from the federal government, actually more than that, through programs like Medicare and Medicaid. So the idea of the government paying for, for medical care in the United States is, is not unique at all. And these federally funded programs are generally pretty effective and actually really popular which is why the proponents of single-payer health care in the United States sometimes label their proposals and bills as Medicare for all. But other forms of federal intervention, like the Affordable Care Act, like I said earlier, the ACA, are not remotely like single-payer, but instead impose mandates on employees and individuals to get insurance through private markets or face penalties. You know, back when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2009, Republicans screamed that it was what they called socialized medicine that was going to turn the United States into some kind of nightmare dystopia where death panels would like decide who gets care and who doesn't. And of course, that was all nonsense, right? But the real irony was the idea that the Affordable Care Act was socialism, when, when really one of the main things it did was actually to force more employers and individuals to participate in a for-profit capitalist system of private health insurance. We already had many forms of what you would call socialized medicine, and that was, again, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Veterans Administration, which provides care through government-run hospitals to millions of veterans around the United States, right? So that's a really, really quick frankly overly simplistic picture of how the, the quote unquote system in the United States works. It's mainly through employers if you happen to have a job but with a healthy massive layer of government intervention on top but it's not single payer for everybody. So that's what the status quo looks like. It's basically this insane crazy quilt of different systems, laws, insurers, providers and we'll certainly link to some sources with charts and diagrams and things to explain it better. But given time restraints let's move on and ask the question okay so we've got this sort of random system, right? What do we compare it to? In other words, what I have this labeled to is compared to what exactly? 
So when you look at countries that have adopted single-payer health care systems or, or something close to it, even if it's not single-payer, you still see fairly complicated systems. I mean, health care is never going to be, you know, super simplistic, right? You can't provide service to hundreds of millions of people without some degree of complexity. But the basic mechanisms by which care is provided in a single-payer country are generally a lot more straightforward than the patchwork system we have in the U.S. So to understand how, the first thing you have to do is let determine exactly which countries have a single payer system, right? And this is actually up for some debate because there are debates, as we're going to talk about in just a few minutes in the definition section, about what single payer actually is and what it requires. So for example, does the government have to be literally the only payer or is it still a single payer system if the government handles the vast majority but maybe individuals pay some themselves, right? But for now, if we look at this from the world population Review. It has this handy summary of countries that kind of by consensus are accepted by most observers as having what you would consider single payer. And the most notable comparators, as you can see, are Japan, the UK, Italy, Spain, and Canada, followed by 12 smaller countries that run all the way down to tiny Iceland that is smaller than many mid-sized US cities. Uh, and at its core, you know, single payer, as we'll talk about in a minute, just means that there is one entity that pays the cost of health care and that's almost always going to be the central government with the cost, of course, paid for uh, by the taxpayers. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, whose National Health Service, or NHS, is among the oldest and most robust single-payer systems in the world, whether you have health coverage doesn't depend on whether your employer offers it or whether you have a job at all, or whether you're too old or whatever age to get out of your parents' plan, or whether your income is below a th certain threshold to get Medicaid, or whether you're over a certain age to get Medicare. Right, so when you go to a doctor in the UK, in most cases, you're gonna be treated at no cost to you. Now, there are a few services, for example, in, in the UK, like dental care and eye care, where you'll have to pay you know, a copay, but the overwhelming majority of all the payments is gonna be made by the government, in other words, by the taxpayers, right? And it's made according to a schedule of costs and fees that whatever the country's health service determines to be appropriate. Yeah, right? and just as a little bit of an aside, I actually got these glasses frames from the UK, and I had to pay a copay in order to get them. So. Luke is a big, is a big, <laughs> fan of UK. First of all, he's a monarchist, you know. Oh, well, hold on. Uh, <laughs> but secondly, he spent the summer in the UK uh, as our ambassador over there. So, so he was lucky to get these very affordable, nice classes at a relatively low cost to him. So that was good. Um, now, obviously, if, if the government is going to be paying for all of the care, and in many cases paying for a lot of the prescription drugs and other things in a single-payer system, they're going to have s tremendous leverage to set the price of a given service or a given like medical product, since they are literally the only buyer in town, right? And also, the government isn't trying to make a profit, right? They're not like an insurance company. They're not like a for-profit hospital. Uh, and it doesn't really have to haggle about what's covered and what isn't. They're the government, right? They make the final determination. Uh, most hospitals and clinics and even things like ambulance services in some single-payer systems like the UK may be owned by the state. In others, they may not. For example, in Canada, they may not. So in many cases, there's no need for like highly paid executives uh, to try to make those turn a profit either, right? So if you take all of these factors together, the fact that you know, the government has this massive leverage that it doesn't have to pay executives to try to turn a profit and things like that, what this means is that the overall cost of care in most single-payer systems, in fact, I'll just say it, in all single-payer systems, the overall cost of care to society is going to be considerably lower than in the United States, like dramatically lower in terms of the overall societal cost. And of course, it also means, and that the biggest difference may be, that the availability and the quality of care that you get in a single-payer system are not dependent on your wealth. Right, there are some exceptions. There are, you know, some, you know, private, you know, uh, medical carriers in, in many single-payer countries that will, you know, give you sort of a boost in that area. But broadly speaking, the poor are going to get the same access to care as the rich. Right. But of course, there are downsides. Yes. In the single-payer system yes. as well. Um, some would argue that, in, you know, one argument that you get sometimes is that like wait times are higher, right? Because the idea is that you can't. Uh, you can't control demand. If you, if you get health care for free, then people are going to use it all the time because it's no cost to them. So, for example, wait times can go up. If you don't have profit incentive, you may not want to move people through as quickly. So that is uh, a really simplified comparison of the U.S. system and the status quo 
to single payer. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but I did want to briefly note that the reason we have the system we have in the United States is not for lack of trying to do better, right? The United States has absolutely historically considered the possibility of single payer and other forms of health care reform. Obviously, we enacted a pretty significant reform uh, in the form of, of Obamacare or the ACA back in 2009. And if you want to learn a little bit more about the history of attempts uh, at uh, single-payer health care going all the way back to really the 1930s in this country. There's a good timeline from healthcarenow.org that you can go through and sort of learn the history from the 1930s up into the 2010s and even today with things like uh, Medicare for All, which is a bill that's kind of perennially pending in Congress, right? So it is worth sort of knowing that this is something, as we said earlier, it's kind of evergreen. It keeps coming up again and again. And it's worth sort of knowing how that's been attempted in the past, right? But the, the biggest thing I want to cover before we get into definitions is just the poor overall performance of the American system and the status quo. So we ask ourselves, how does the United States system do in comparison to its peers? Does it do in comparison to single payer systems? And the short answer is that objectively the current US system does not stack up at all in comparison to single payer or any other more centralized system. Uh, and really the reason why healthcare is such an evergreen topic in the United States and reform is such an evergreen topic is to put it bluntly, the United States is, is just terrible at providing healthcare in comparison to other rich countries in comparison to its peers. So in the world of Fox News and other social medias, this might seem like a pretty debatable point, but in the world of actual data and objective analysis, it's simply not, it's just a fact. By almost every metric, in almost every study, the United States lags far behind its peers in terms of quality of care, equity of providing care, and overall cost. And we could easily spend an entire video just documenting all of the ways that the United States falls short. But in the interest of time, we're going to give it a very quick rundown and then link you to some of the sources that really summarize the problem in more depth. The biggest source that we have on this is from the Commonwealth Fund in 2021. Commonwealth Fund has done an excellent job of documenting sort of problems with the U.S. healthcare system. They're a credible source, uh, so this is going to be from them. And, and what the 2021 study from the Commonwealth Fund does is it sort of assesses the overall quality of care in the U.S., comparing it to its peers using five basic metrics. So access to care, uh, care process, administrative efficiency, equity, and healthcare outcomes, right? So in four of those five areas, the U.S. finishes dead last of the 11 wealthy countries that are sort of considered its peers, right? Only in one of them, which is care process, and that refers to things like preventative medicine, early screenings, communication between doctors and patients, does the U.S. finish second. In every single one of the areas other than that, it's finishing dead last. So just for example, if we look at the area of equity, where we're talking about just how fairly we are allocating uh, care in the United States, it, we shouldn't be surprised that the U.S. Is, is last by a huge margin, right? Because we're the only country in the world that puts the primary burden of insurance, right, on, on the individual and on the employer. If you look at sort of the overall comparative health system scores that are summarized here by the Commonwealth Fund, uh, you can see it's almost kind of comical. It's like a hockey stick, right? It's, it's the United States falling off the end of, of, of the graph in terms of overall performance if you look at all five metrics. And this is a good summary that you can look at. Uh, the numbers that you could actually read in cards are actually in the study, but this is a good visualization of it, right? So if we're performing that badly in all of these areas, well, hey, maybe, maybe it's because we just refuse to pay the cost, right? Maybe we're cheap. Maybe we're just not spending enough, right? Uh, so that happens sometimes. You know, we, we do fail to pay the cost of certain things like, for example, infrastructure. We don't spend as much on bridges and roads. Is that the problem? Uh, but no, that is not the case when it comes to U.S. health care. In addition to being the worst rich country healthcare system in terms of quality and outcomes, the U.S. is also by far the most expensive, spending 16.8% of its GDP on healthcare in comparison to an average of 5.8% for other highly developed countries. And as you can see here, once again, this is just another chart from the Commonwealth Fund. We are just completely off the scale. This, right? I mean, the only reason why we're a competitor with a lot of these other countries is because we're such a rich country. But in terms of how we manage healthcare, we're not in their league at all. Yeah. Yes, exactly. If you look at this last chart that we have, and will pop up on the screen in terms of comparing 
actual outcomes and then cross-referencing that against spending as a percentage of GDP, again, it just gets sort of comical, right? It gets almost sort of tragicomic. We don't belong in the same league as these other countries, whether they're using single payer or not. And this is why we say, is why I said earlier in the introduction, this really is kind of an app-heavy topic because it's very, very hard using any responsible metric to argue that the United States is not a vastly more expensive, wildly inequitable, right? In other words, because it's dependent on wealth, poor performing system that frankly is more like, as you say, a developing country than it is like a rich country. The only reason we're even on these charts is because we're rich, not because we are a peer of any of these other countries in our actual performance or spending. So that is a way, way too fast tour of kind of the background. There's no way you can cover it adequately. We will try to make up for the brevity of that with some of the sources we link to, and I'll strongly encourage you to read those. But with that, now I think it is time to jump to uh, some specific definitions of the terms of the resolution. Let's start with the United States. I don't think this term is really going to be too significant in the debate. Uh, it may have been a little bit better if they had used the United States federal government to really remove any kind of ambiguity. But I imagine that nearly everyone is going to agree here that the actor is the United States federal government. And sometimes you see a few debaters try and get a little bit too flexible with the phrase the United States, uh, meaning each individual state of the 50 states to try and sort of ambush the negative with a case that they're not prepared for. But it really doesn't make sense here, and I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of it. It's probably just going to be kind of straightforward. Yeah, I think like a, a single-payer system that was run at the state level as opposed to the federal level would be worse in every possible way, right? It would be worse <laughs> from a distributional perspective because, you know, poor states like Mississippi couldn't afford it. Um, it. It's going to be worse from an efficiency perspective because you wouldn't be able to use bargaining power as well. So there's no advantage to trying something cute like that. So again, I think you're right, Luke. I don't think you're going to see a lot of people getting too clever. The actor here is is the United States federal government. If anybody tries to get away from that, I think most judges are kind of going to cock their eye a little sideways and be like, what are you trying to get away with here? Um, so the next term is ought. So, you know, Webster uh, defines ought as a term expressing advisability or obligation, and then Collins D Dictionary defines it as to be compelled by obligation or duty. So it, it's pretty general. It's, it's, it's really just a different version of should. It makes it a policy resolution as opposed to a fact resolution. It's pretty straightforward. I, I think in most rounds, just about every debater is going to tacitly affect ought means just this is something we should do, right, for whatever. And we're going to define what that is and why that is through the value and the criteria and the substantive contentions, right? Now, I will say that sometimes there is a trick that some debaters try to do uh, where they say that ought implies a moral obligation and that because it's a moral obligation, this somehow removes the burden of like talking about practical impacts and how you're practically going to get it done. In other words, some apps will argue that the word ought just sort of magically means they don't have to worry about the practical details like how single payer healthcare will get paid for or even whether it will achieve all of its stated goals or whether it's better than other alternatives because we're talking about morality as opposed to policy. And I will be honest with you, Luke, I've never understood this argument, right? I don't understand why people think that you can divorce morality from, first of all, I don't understand why they think that ought is just a moral obligation as opposed to just a general obligation or duty. And I definitely don't understand why they would argue that a moral obligation can ignore the practical implications of what you do, right? Well, I mean, I think it's really kind of situational in terms of the word ought. Not with this resolution. I do think that we should talk about what actually happens practically because there really is no such thing as a free lunch. Right. We can't just say that there's going to be a universal single payer system and completely ignores what happens afterwards to people's uh, incomes or their costs, taxes, all kinds of different impacts. So don't allow your opponent to just get away with saying it's going to happen and it's going to be all right for no reason. You have to make your opponent talk about the actual impacts of this round. Well, and I think it's just a matter of logic. It, when you say somebody ought to do something, you cannot divorce that from the impacts of what they do. So for example, if you're a doctor and you find an injured person on the sidewalk and you ask whether you, quote, ought to treat them, well, that depends on what you rationally expect will happen. If you're a trauma surgeon and they're bleeding and it's likely you can save their life, yes, you ought to treatment. treat them, right? If you are a dermatologist, right, and you have no idea how to treat a wound and you think, well, I might actually make this worse, then no, you ought not treat them. You ought to like call 911 instead. So the likely outcome definitely matters to the moral obligation. So anyway, that's a lot about ought. I, I don't think that there's a lot there. I mean, some people try to get cute on it, but I think it's pretty straightforward. So implement, uh, super straightforward here, implement according to Oxford English Dictionary is to put a decision plan or agreement
amendment into effect. I really don't think there's really anything to debate here. It just means that when you vote for the AF, the, the fiat that they implement, the thing that, the, that, that happens is that some single payer healthcare system that is universal, right, comes into play. And so that leads to the, to the biggest and most important of the terms in the resolution, which is single payer universal healthcare system, which is a, is a pretty involved phrase as phrases go. So this obviously is the primary object of evaluation of the resolution, and it's where if you're going to have topicality fights or fights about which side has which ground, I think that's, this is where they're most likely to come from, right? Uh, I don't think you're going to see a ton of definitional fights, but I do think you will still see some of them, and I think you have to be mindful in writing your cases and definitions. And it's not just the debaters that are going to be arguing over definitions either. There are lots of scholars who argue over what the actual definition of universal single-payer healthcare system is. I mean, just the other day, I was reading an article that was written by two authors who compiled, I think, 12 or 13 diff different definitions they collected from all around the world, from all sorts of different systems with their own kind of uh, gears and wires on how their system works, and they all claim to be a universal single-payer healthcare system. And we're actually gonna talk about that in just a second. So real quick, before we jump to that, uh, I think one important thing to note is that the ag exact phrase used in the resolution, single-payer universal healthcare system, typically is not used like verbatim in the literature. That, that sort of five-word phrase is not used. Uh, it's typically shortened to something like single-payer healthcare or something like that. And the reason for that is that the additional word universal is kind of redundant in most discussions because when most experts experts talk about single-payer healthcare, they're generally just sort of assuming that it will be universally available to whatever population you're talking about. So for example, if you look to uh, like this, the Wikipedia article on single-payer healthcare system, it literally starts with the line, single-payer healthcare is a type of universal healthcare in which costs of essential healthcare for all residents are covered by a single public system, right? So if single-payer healthcare is generally considered like a species or a type of universal healthcare, why did the NSDA add the apparently superfluous word universal? And I think I know the answer to this. In fact, I think it's pretty clear. My guess is that the topic committee probably did it as a precaution to keep the debate focused on a nationwide system for all U.S. residents. Because as we talked about earlier, you know, while most discussion of single payer is about nationwide systems, you can absolutely have a single payer system that's not universal, that's limited to like certain participants. And as we said earlier, a, a good example of that in the United States that already exists in the status quo is the Veterans Administration, commonly called the VA. Uh, you could also argue Medicare and Medicaid. Now here's the thing, people are gonna quibble about whether any of those actually technically meets the definition of single payer, and we're gonna talk about that in just one second about why that's important, but they're all very close, right? So if they're all close, you don't wanna have a topic where the debate is like the, the neg coming in and saying, we already have this in the status quo, so we don't need to do it, it already exists. So I think that's why universal is in there. So I would kind of, I would probably define universal healthcare and single payer healthcare separately. So a definition of universal healthcare from Investopedia is universal health care refers to systems in which all residents of a particular geographical area or country have health insurance. So I think the argument you'd use there is that to be topical, right, the AF has to propose a system in which all residents of the United States have access to health care. Maybe you could get into something as to whether, for example, undocumented immigrants get it, and that could be an interesting point. But, you know, I, I digress on that. We don't have enough time to spend, you know, too much time on it. But what it really means is once you've, once you've clarified what universal means, means, uh, you're really going to be focusing on what the term single payer means, right? What single payer health care is. Yep, and here's a little bit about this article that I kind of mentioned earlier. It's from Lewin Brook in 2017. This article is just all about all those different definitions that I mentioned. I don't know all of them uh, by memory, but if you read the article, they're all there. Right. And later in the piece, Lou and Brooke write at length about how there are various features that authors disagree about in terms of whether they're required for something to be a true single payer system. Uh, like for example, they talk about how in the 90s, there's a distinction between single payer, which meant the government pays and they don't actually provide the care and systems where the government both pays and provides for the care and delivery like the NHS in the United Kingdom. They also talk about things like whether the fact that a system has a copay. In other words, a copay is a term, one of many terms you'll have to learn, which just means when you go to the doctor, you don't pay the vast majority of the cost, but you pay a small amount that's sort of meant to deter people from sort of frivolous use of medical care, right? $25 or something like that, even if the cost is many hundreds of dollars. But the question would be, as Lou and Brooke address and, and many other things as well, um, does that copay 
that the individual pays mean that the system is not single payer, right? And so later in the video, we're going to talk in more specificity about why these distinctions might matter, right? And the reason that they might matter just generally is because the AF would like to define, I think, single payer as broadly as possible, right? Because AF has a very strong argument, as we alluded to before, that the status quo is so bad in the United States compared to its peers that we really just have to do something. And so the AF wants as many alternatives as possible that are out there in the real world to be considered single payer, to be considered AF ground. In other words, if you do anything remotely like government funding of health care, we're going to have a broad definition. We're going to classify it as single payer. It's going to be AF ground and the AF is going to win the round, right? Now, as we're going to talk about later on, the negative, on the other hand, would like to narrow the definition of single payer as much as possible so that as many systems or policies are not considered single payer and are therefore neg ground for things like counter plans and alternatives, right? Yeah, and the main point of this article is that there's no singular definition of the term and that many academics and nations and hospitals have their own ideas of what this actually is. So in order to have a clean, good debate, you know, no trash lying around, choose one definition and stick with it the whole way. Just as I said earlier, I really recommend a more general definition of the term, like the one from the National Library of Medicine, and that way you can really use any system that you'd like as an example of a success or a fail on either side of the debate. So it's actually advantageous if you're running on the affirmative or the negative side of this. I, I think the affirmative though in particular is going to really like this consensus definition that Lou and Brooke use. So if you look to the to the initial uh, quote that we had, they, they say that single payer is where one entity collects funds and pays for health care on behalf of an entire population. That's a nice simple broad definition like the kind Luke is talking about. It also doesn't have like a lot of speci specific qualifiers. Like it doesn't talk about for example how it has to be all of the money, right? It doesn't talk about you know any other specific requirements. It's just a very general, broad uh, description. So I think it's really good for the app if you want a broader uh, example. Now, if you're on the NAG and you want maybe a more demanding, specific, kind of robust definition, there is this from the Harvard Health blog. It says, in a single-payer healthcare system, rather than multiple competing health insurance companies, a single public or quasi-public agency takes responsibility for financing health care for all residents. That is, everyone has health insurance under one health insurance plan, has access to all these specific services services, right? And it says individuals may still choose where they receive care. So that's a lot of specific stuff. If you're in the negative, you kind of like that because it sort of narrows the scope. So with the definitions out of the way, just really quickly, let's talk about values and criteria. My main criticism, as I said earlier, of this resolution is it's very much a policy resolution. It doesn't lend itself naturally to purely philosophical debates about sort of deontology, critical theory, roles, things like that. You do have to put in the work to kind of adapt your case to be anything other than sort of a raw utilitarian consequentialist, look how many lives we save kind of thing. That said, I do think there are ways you can do this, but I think they kind of more naturally fit with the arguments themselves on the respective sides of the resolution. So I think maybe the most efficient way to do that is rather than spending time now talking about like values and criteria, let's jump into the substantive arguments on the app and then the neg, and we can see first of all how the philosophy works and how sort of the moral value arguments work, and then we can move on to some more concrete arguments about things like empirics and data and live saves and stuff like that. So with that, let's jump right into affirmative arguments. All right, let's get into some affirmative arguments. But before we get into all of the numbers and the data and the evidence, let's talk about some simple philosophy. Simple philosophy, I know, sounds like an oxymoron, but let's get into some utilitarian arguments just to start. So obviously the most basic and probably common argument that you're gonna come across for this resolution is gonna be consequentialism and utilitarianism. And if you look at single payer, and if you look at the status quo patchwork system, or maybe at the negative, like a counter plan, you might ask yourself, which one achieves the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest number of people? Uh, that's just basic utilitarianism and consequentialism. And more specifically, you'd probably use some form of rule utilitarianism, since the resolution really isn't asking us about any individual's choice, but rather what rule, what law we should use for all of society. Yeah, you know, I, I think some people are going to run away from the sort of raw utilitarianism because there are a lot of, you know, arguments against it. There are a lot of critiques of utilitarianism, but I think we have to be realistic on this resolution. Again, as we've said before, it's a policy heavy resolution. It's something where data and empirics are really going to matter. And so I think you have to be ready to argue those things no matter what. Plus, 
you know, even if you do talk about, as we're going to in a second, ideas like, you know, for example, deontology, ideas like critical theory, you're still going to have to run those arguments back through, you know, sort of the impacts analysis, right? Because we don't do healthcare as sort of a performative thing or a purely ethical thing. The reason we do healthcare, whatever the ultimate philosophical justification is, is to save lives, right? And it's to do it in a way that is cost effective, that it's equitable, and it saves as many lives as possible. Now, having said that, I absolutely do think, as we've talked about a lot through throughout the video that we do need to look at some other alternatives philosophically. And I think there are some good ways that you can do that, right? So for example, just looking to the idea of, of Kantian ethics, there's this really good piece from Joseph Crisp in 2017 called A Kantian Argument for Universal Healthcare, right? And so what Crisp does here is he points to several ways that you could link uh, single-payer healthcare to sort of non-utilitarian, like moral imperatives, right? So the first one is he talks about treating human beings as an end and not a means. And he writes, Kant stated the categorical imperative in more than one way. The two most well-known formulations are these. Act only according to that maxim whereby you can at the same time will that it should be universal law. So in other words, universal law, but also also this one, the second formulation, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end, right? So when we look at that second formulation, the argument there might be that any system that requires a person to say, work at a job, pay a premium, pay a copay, perform some other utilitarian task. As, as a prerequisite to getting health care and, and, and having their life taken care of, right, treats a person as a means rather than an end, right? Therefore, you know, having health care be something like a reward for hard work, you know, basically dehumanizes people. And then the last one and the one that I think is probably the best is this idea from Crisp about Kant's distinction between value and dignity. And he says this, Kant distinguished in the realm of ends between those things which have dignity and those things which have a value or a price. What has a price is such that something else can be put in its place as an equivalent. By contrast, that which is elevated above all price and admits of no equivalent has a dignity, right? Things that have value are things that can be replaced by other things, material objects, right? But since health and since humanity, like your life has dignity rather than value, it cannot be treated as a market good. It has no equivalent, right? You might choose to buy an iPhone rather than a television set, or you might choose to buy neither, but you have no choice to fix a broken arm to undergo treatment for a life-threatening disease, right? So the idea here is that Kant recognizes that human life and health have dignity as opposed to value. You cannot put a dollar value on them, right? And so as soon as you agree with that, right, as soon as you agree with the idea that life and health are beyond price, there's a moral imperative to sort of take them out of a capitalist system in which you're requiring, you know, go to work, get a job, maintain the job, pay the premium, pay the copay, and in exchange for getting your, your life and your health taken care of, right? And yes, it's true, it's impossible to completely remove price from the healthcare system because of the inherent scarcity of resources. But a single payer system goes as far as we can possibly go away from the commodification of a life by pooling our resources together and providing the greatest care possible based on need and not based on ability to pay. Or in other words, we're not making you pay a price for your life. So the second kind of philosophical angle would be sort of Rawlsian justice, right? And Rawls, as we know, says that justice requires prioritizing the good of the least advantage because that's the policy that we would choose if we didn't know our position in society. Well, of course, this fits very nicely with a single payer system, which is all about sort of the equitable distribution of health care. It's not based on wealth or employment or ability to pay, right? And on a similar note, if you wanted to run something kind of similar to that with authors who focus on things like systemic racism, class inequities, structural violence, all those things, of course, link very nicely to single payer because of its more equitable distribution of outcomes and resources. And we'll talk more about that in just a second, right? Yeah, but again, for all of these theories, like we said a minute ago, these are arguments are all going to have to link back to real world data. So we might as well go ahead and get started on it. Yeah, so, so we jump to uh, the first sort of substantive argument, which is that the status quo system in the United States is wildly inequitable, right? So Kant would really care, right, that the existing system is incredibly unfavorable to the poor and to marginalized people. And there is plenty of data showing that it is. 
So there's this excellent summary of numbers on the lack of insurance uh, among marginalized folks that comes from the Kaiser Family Foundation in December of 2019. And as you can see here, we'll pop it up on the screen, uh, in 2018, long after the Affordable Care Act went into effect, 27.8 million non-elderly Americans didn't have health insurance coverage. And that's actually up from 2017, so it's not declining and cratering like you would expect in a post-healthcare reform world, right? Most of the uninsured, according to KFF, are low-income working families with people of color more likely to be uninsured than white folks. Uh, the overwhelming majority of uninsured are uninsured because of economics, not because of choice. People are not simply choosing to risk it, with 45% saying it was because insurance was too costly, 21% saying it was due to job loss, 13% saying it was due to Medicaid loss, and just 3% saying it was due to choice. At the greatest risk is in the 14 states that did not expand Medicaid coverage. So you had a choice as a state whether or not you wanted to expand Medicaid coverage for poor individuals. And these are the poorest states in the country, right? They're states like Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. They're also, by the way, states that are disproportionately home to populations that are, are people of color, right? And so this shows you that we have massive, you know, uninsurance problems in the United States and that they are disproportionately affecting the poor and people of color, right? In all of these areas, though, the United States is dramatically worse than its peers. And this is, again, from the source we had earlier from the 2021 Commonwealth Fund study. And if you look at this, what this is showing you is the number of people in each country that are foregoing health care in any given year right, due to issues of cost. And if you look down at the low end, we have the UK, which is, I think, by consensus, a single payer system. And they split it up into higher income and lower income folks. So in the UK, higher income folks, 7% of them had to forego care due to cost, 12% of lower income folks. And for most of these, if you look across the spectrum there, you know, higher income people are in the single digits, lower income people are up maybe in the 20s. If you look at the, at the United States, though, again, it's just off the, the, off the charts in comparison to its peers. Right. So the United States has uh, among even upper income people, our upper income people are foregoing care at the same rate as lower income people in other countries, 27 percent. But then 50 percent of lower income Americans are skipping needed care. They're not going to the doctor. They're not buying prescription drugs. They're not getting the things that they need as a result of, uh, of the cost of care. Right. Right, and it's not just some global problem that you can't fix. It's a problem with our current system. Right. And single-payer countries like the United Kingdom are in the very low end of these metrics with just 7 and 12% respectively missing care due to cost. And we're going to come to that in just a second and talk about why single-payer systems do better, obviously. That's a major part of the AF case. But this also links into, I think, another impact that a lot of folks are probably going to want to run with. I don't mean to be cynical about this because it is a substantively important social issue, but that's the issue of racial inequity, right? So if we want to put an even finer point on the idea that care is distributed unfairly in the United States, there is a ton of evidence that the status quo leads to dramatically worse outcomes for people of color, most notably for black and Hispanic people in the United States, right? So this comes from Jamila Taylor writing for the Century Foundation in 2019 on racial disparities uh, in the status quo. And again, we'll just pop the card up on the screen. There's, there's a lot more in the article than just this. And it talks about how, yes, the Affordable Care Act has been good, right, but you still see massive millions and millions of people in the United States who are uninsured and there are these disparities that we talk about with African Americans having a 9.7 percent uninsured rate with white Americans being just a little bit over half that with 5.4 percent right so this is contributing to what we call you know sort of the systemic racism and systemic bias in the United States she goes on to talk about the, the sort of specific health consequences that come about as a result of this in the status quo. So African American women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy related causes than white women. African American infant mortality rate is twice that of white infants. Uh, African Americans are more likely to die from cancer and heart disease, two of the biggest killers in the United States than whites, and are greater risk for onset of diabetes. Um, now we, we are seeing them drop over a 15 year period, she says, but many chronic illnesses we still see that black Americans are just more likely to be subject to death and other forms of morbidity as a result of these diseases. We also know that single payer could help fix these racial disparities because that's exactly what Medicare does. Remember, Medicare is very similar to a single payer system. And when people of color become eligible for Medicare at 65, what we see is that their likelihood of having health coverage spikes dramatically and, when, and that closes the gap between white people. Yeah, there's almost sort of a natural experiment that goes on in the United States through Medicare 
right now about what single payer would look like, right? This is from Wallace and others, and what it shows is summarized by the Medicare Right Center, and we'll pop that summary up on the screen. But when you have these disparities in terms of coverage levels for, for black Americans, for African Americans, and then when they become eligible at age 65 for Medicare, they close dramatically, right? So we see, you know, right off the bat that when we when we put people into something that's more like a single payer system, a government funded single payer system, the coverage gaps and the racial disparities immediately start to go down. That's not hypothetical, that's not conjecture, that's what happens in a real world experiment in the United States when people become eligible for Medicare. A better summary of why single payer solves for racial inequalities is this uh, from Carol Heaton with a group called Maine All Care. This is from 2021 and it summarizes just a whole bunch of statistics on racial disparities in the status quo. So first of all, she does a great job summarizing even more data about racial inequalities, and it's a really handy article for that, so make sure that you read it. But what it says is that in the VA system, this is the Veterans Affairs system, black patients actually have greater longevity than whites. And after the age of 65, when all Americans have health care coverage, the disparity in mortality rates between the races starts to lessen. So here again, what she's showing you is that when we do a real world experiment in the United States and we try single payer, either through the VA or through Medicare, we actually see black Americans having greater longevity than their white counterparts, not only erasing, but I guess you could say even slightly reversing the disparity there. And you start to see lower mortality rate. Right. So the next argument that we want to cover is single payer is generally superior to the status quo right. or the current system. So this is the part in the show where we admit that this debate is really going to center on an empirical fight about outcomes. Right. And we might just go ahead and admit it. Better outcomes in countries that have single payer systems. Let's focus on cost and efficiency. According to a study by the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, the United States spends the most on healthcare costs on, out of any nation at $10,586 per capita. So if we're going to be spending exorbitant amounts of money like that on healthcare, we ought to have something to show for it, but we really don't. And if we compare that per capita data from other single payer countries, it's not even close. So for example, if we look at Japan, uh, per capita cost is $4,691, Canada is $5,370, the UK is $5,268. In other words, our peer countries in terms of wealth are roughly half as expensive per person per capita as the United States. In addition to that, I would say the best analysis of the literature, in other words, an overall analysis of the literature shows really beyond dispute that single payer saves significantly over the status quo. And this is from Diane Archer in The Hill of February 2020. And she notes that Christopher Kai and others at UC Berkeley reviewed 22 economic analyses of single payer systems and every single one of those 22 found that single payer saves significantly over the current US system, right? This is true regardless of the ideological position of who's studying it. Even the conservative Mercatus Center found that Medicare for All, which is a form of single payer, would save about $2 trillion in the U.S. budget, uh, overall budget, public and private, over 10 years in comparison to the current system. And Archer also notes that uh, Medicare for All, again, a form of single payer, will save about $600 billion of the $812 billion that the U.S. currently spends on health care administration alone. And I want to pause and talk about this for just one second, right? It is absolutely obscene that the United States spends $812 billion a year on health care administration. This is not healthcare itself. This is the cost of like managing healthcare and executives and paperwork and things like that. This is more than the $738 billion that we spend on defense. It is more than 10 times what the United States federal government spends on education, which is $68 billion. And again, this is not spent on healthcare itself, but on things like billing disputes, hospital administrators, coverage fights, litigation, lawyers. By removing all of these steps and replacing them with a single system that sets the rules, you know, we save more than the total amount every year that we spend on the entire U.S. military, which is by far the most expensive military in the world. And while cost savings are important, what's even more important is superior outcomes via single payer. So as we noted earlier, according to the Commonwealth Fund, the United States is ranked dead last in healthcare outcomes amongst 11 other Western countries on measures of health system equity, access, 
administrative efficiency, care delivery, and health care outcomes. And since 2004, the United States has ranked last in every one of six similar studies by the Commonwealth Fund. Exactly. Let's be clear about that. This wasn't a one-off. Every single time we run the race, we finish last, right? And Commonwealth Fund is a, is a pretty reputable source on that, right? Um, the, the story in countries with single-payer health care, though, is very different. And this is something that you have to be able to tell the judge to sort of, you know, this is, this is the solvency part of the debate. Hopefully you're not saying solvency in a, an LD round. We don't want to make it sound please like policy. Yeah. yeah, please don't. But but this is this is where you show not only is there a problem in the status quo, but this is how we solve it, right? So for example, on access. Again, US ranks last on measures of financial barriers to care with lots of people, 33% of people reporting they didn't take prescription drugs. If you look at the countries in the rankings that have single payer, right, they're dramatically lower, right? We're looking at the UK at 7%, we're looking at Sweden and the Netherlands at 8%, right? These are all dramatically lower than the United States. Single payer is clearly solving for this, right? If we look at outcomes, the US is last in infant mortality, it's last in life expectancy at age 60, and deaths that are prevent potentially preventable with timely access to effective care. Again, all of the single payer countries in the rankings are doing significantly better, right? If we look at efficiency, the U.S. is ranked near the bottom on administrative efficiency. Again, these are the massive costs we just talked about because of all the time patients and doctors spend dealing with insurance disputes and administrative issues. Like in the U.S., 54% of doctors report problems trying to get their patients coverage of insurance. In single-payer countries, again, according to the same data, this rate is 6%. So we are slashing the administrative barriers to care dramatically. And lastly, and this is the most important one, and I think this is kind of the kicker, and it's the statistic you probably are going to want to have in just about every case. The objective at the end of the day of any healthcare system ought to be mainly to save lives. Yes, quality of life, but also, but mainly saving lives, right? So The Lancet, which is arguably the most respected healthcare journal in the world, predicts that a single payer system in the United States would save a net of 68,000 lives annually by providing each person coverage and preventing the deaths that would otherwise happen if they were not insured, right? Yeah, and while we're talking about this utilitarian cost benefit analysis, it's probably worth looking into one specific benefit of single payer, which is unique benefits to lowering drug prices. Drug prices are very high in the United States compared to other countries, and these pr high prices can reduce people's access to life-saving drugs such as insulin, which is often used to illustrate how dramatic the price differences are in the United States. I mean, for example, the World Population Review pointed out in 2022 uh, this card right here that we're going to show on the screen. Yeah, as you can see right here, and, and you've probably heard this in public debates recently in the United States, like in the 2020 election, but the average price of insulin in the United States is five to ten times higher, like $98.70 as compared to all other OECD countries at $8.81, right? Now, so switching over to single payer, assuming drugs are part of the new system, which they absolutely could be, and probably it would be at least to some extent, would probably reduce drug prices and make them far more available, right? And, and there are plenty of specific proposals that would do that, for example, like the Medicare for All bill. Um, so, for example, Kaiser Health News in 2019 uh, talks about how, for example, the most recent Medicare for All bill, which is the most practical single payer proposal on the table, would, would, number one, allow the government to negotiate for better prices of prescription drugs, but also have a compulsory licensing scheme, which would say, if you don't play ball with the government, we would be able to just basically compulsorily license your, your, your drugs and make them available generically. But just to be clear about why this is the case, it gives the government tremendous leverage. Right now, you know, insurance companies individually don't have a lot of leverage to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies for these, you know, drugs that cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for treatment. The federal government, if it is the major buyer or perhaps the only buyer of drugs, right, would have far, far more leverage. This is why, for example, in a country like the UK, in countries that have more centralized healthcare systems, they're able to drive these drug prices down so much because they're the only game in town, right? These pharmaceutical companies can't take their ball and walk away because they have to deal with the government, which allows you to lower the price of drugs dramatically, right? Right, right. And I mean, the way that I think that this is a uniquely strong point on the affirmative side is because you'll have to consider that this is a real world, non-hypothetical impact. Like if we do a single payer system, this will actually happen, is that the government will be the sole uh, actor that is going to control these prices so that we're actually going to be able to make drug prices lower. 
Next argument is ending dependence on employers for health coverage. So, you know, as a kind of a general practical and moral principle, the idea of leaving your employer more or less in charge of whether you can go to the doctor is kind of weird if you think about it in a historical sense. It's arguably kind of morally indefensible. I mean, your employer is there to extract as much value from you as they can, right, to make a profit. They're not there to look after your welfare. So the idea that for the vast majority of American adults, the, the arbiter and the determiner of whether you can go to the doctor and pay for it is your employer is kind of strange. And there are a lot of practical reasons why having employers in charge of something as fundamental as medical care is weird and, 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 and strange and, and problematic and that single payer would fix it. So Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project notes that employer coverage is incredibly unstable, right? He writes, the truth is that people who love their employer-based insurance do not get to hold on to it in our current system. Instead, they lose that insurance constantly, all the time, over and over again. It's a complete nightmare, right? The only way to enjoy true health security where your insurance can never be taken away for any reason is a seamless system where people do not constantly churn on and off of insurance. And the second issue with relying on employers for health insurance is that it locks people into suboptimal jobs. So this is from Ed Dolan from the Niskanen Center in uh, 2018. Uh, it, what he talks about is the term job lock refers to the tendency of employer-sponsored health insurance to discourage people from changing jobs, from starting a business on their own, or from reducing their hours to care for family members or move gradually toward retirement. Job lock undermines labor market mobility, makes it harder to match workers to the most suitable jobs, and cuts labor productivity. He talks about how there's anecdotal evidence. Everybody knows, if you're an adult, everybody knows somebody who has been unable to quit their job because they had to hang on to their health insurance for no other reason. And he talks about how there's a large body of academic literature on the extent of job lock that is summarized in a study by Dean Baker. Talks about how there is wide agreement that people with employer-sponsored health insurance are less likely to change jobs, right? Yeah, and I really think that that's pretty problematic for a couple of reasons. One, it's just wrong to force people into right. a job that they don't like, that they're not comfortable in, but they literally need it to survive. And then another problem that comes out of that is these suboptimal jobs aren't always that great for society as a whole. They're economically suboptimal, right? Right, and if we're trying to do the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people, why would we force people to do things that aren't in the best interest of the most amount of people? Yeah, a thriving economy is one where people can take risks. You know, if you have a good idea for a business or think you could do a better job than your employer at providing a service, we want you to go out there and roll the dice and try. That's how an economy grows. That's how it becomes more efficient. And when you are dependent on your employer's benevolence to basically keep you alive, right, to, to ensure that you can get health coverage, you have a massive disincentive to go out in the world and roll the dice and try to do something that's economically competitive and risky. Under a single payer system, none of that matters. Your health care is a total non-factor in your ability to go out and take economic risks and make the economy more robust. And so this is another strong argument uh, for why uh, single payer is actually going to be a boon for the economy rather than a drag. Now the last point I have uh, for, the, for, for the AF is kind of a defensive point, but I think it's one that's worth noting uh, on the affirmative, and that is that government handling nearly all of health care really isn't that big of a jump for the United States. Uh, again, it's kind of a defensive point, but you're likely to see negative debaters, and we're going to try to do this later, talk about how this is going to be this massive transition from a capitalist model to basically a socialist model, and that's risky and that's harmful. But the answer is that it's not really that risky and it's not even particularly novel because we're already doing a huge amount of government payment for health care in the status quo. It's just that we're doing it in the worst, most wasteful possible way. Um, so first, you know, number one, government payment for health care in one form or another is something that nearly all developed countries already do. Uh, we've talked about this earlier with the Commonwealth Fund and we'll probably provide some sources on how basically you know government spending as opposed to private spending is higher in just about every country. But second, we're almost two-thirds of the way arguably in the United States toward having government payment anyway. We're just choosing to do it through a mishmash of multiple programs, public-private hybrids and layers of administration. 
So as Archer in 2020 notes, if you're thinking that having the federal government guarantee coverage to all Americans is a big, big deal, it's actually not. The government already pays for about two thirds of health care costs. Among other things, it pays for Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, TRICARE, and a wide range of state and local health care programs, along with private insurance for government employees and tax subsidies for private insurance. So this, as Archer argues, adds up to about two thirds of all the health care spending in the United States in the status quo. Now this is debatable, right? People disagree, not everybody agrees it's two thirds. But, but even a more conservative, esti conservative estimate by the Department of Health and Human Services in February 2019 admits that the government currently pays about 45% of health care costs in the United States, which will rise to 47% by 2027. So one of the things that I think that the app is really going to want to point out here, it's really not a debate about whether the government ought to be paying for health care. The government is paying for health care. It's going to continue paying for massive amounts of health care. It's going to happen either way in the status quo or in the app world. The question is about whether we want an organized, fair, rational, compassionate, cost-effective way that we have intelligently designed, right? Something that we have thought through rationally, like the National Health Service, right? Like systems in other countries. Or we want this sort of random Frankenstein's monster that sort of evolved, you know, randomly and is the, both the worst functioning and the most costly system in the rich developed world. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And it really kind of reminds me of this analogy that was used in the book Crime and Punishment, where a man was thinking about giving his cloak to a, a very poor person who didn't have a cloak. And he said, why don't we just tear it in half so that both of us can have a cloak? But in that situation, they would both freeze to death and it's better for one person to have the cloak. So kind of in the same way in this kind of debate, we really want to focus our energy on making this system that just does one thing really well, rather than this patchwork system where we try and do too many things at once or not enough things, and then everything gets all mixed up, too complicated, and no one gets what they need. Very clever. All right, so with that, that's all we've got on the affirmative, so we will move on to some negative arguments. All right, so on the negative, as we talked about earlier, I think the negative definitely has an uphill battle on this because there's just such a strong argument that the status quo of the United States, the patchwork system that we have, is one of the worst in the world. Um, and that really means, I think, that the negative is going to want to try to sort of position itself to argue not that we should do nothing, but that single payer isn't the solution. And so we're going to be focusing pretty heavily on alternatives possible counter plans. But before we do that, I want to start with one argument, which is that, and the way I've labeled this in my notes is that nobody in the real world actually does true single payer. This is sort of a definitional argument. You know, some people love definitional arguments, some hate them, but I actually think this one is worth considering and possibly trying. So the argument is that the term single payer healthcare is sort of like a unicorn. And when you come right down to it, there's actually nothing out there in nature that meets the definition of a unicorn. And there's nothing out there in nature that meets the definition of true single payer healthcare. There are things that are close, but nobody's actually doing real true single payer. And let me explain what I mean by this, right? The app has this really high burden to persuade you to implement a pretty extreme idealized system that nobody's doing. So the most basic element of a single payer system should be, and it's common sense in several definitions, that one actor, that is the government, is paying for all health care, right? As a paper by the Commonwealth Fund explains, and this is from uh, Gilead, I think is how you pronounce it, and others back in 2019, Quote, under a true single payer system, one government run insurance carrier would finance the entire healthcare industry, rendering private health insurance unnecessary. However, nearly every universal healthcare system incorporates private health insurance. The role played by private insurance varies depending on three aspects of public insurance coverage, comprehensiveness of covered benefits, cost sharing, and access to providers. So this is a very credible source on single payer explaining that single payer, quote, would involve total government funding, but nobody actually does that. Everybody has certain elements of private insurance, co-pays, individuals paying a part of their funding, right? So Drew Altman of the Kaiser Family Foundation echoes this and shows you that, you know, it may be surprising, uh, but no other developed nation has zero out-of-pocket cost. Even those that treat healthcare as a basic human right, you know, as Medicare for All supporters do, that's because their national health plans have cost sharing or allow people to purchase healthcare outside the plan or both. So if you look at this chart, you can see the average amount of, of, of per capita out-of-pocket spending in developed countries. And you can see that even in places that have single-payer healthcare systems by consensus, like Japan and the UK and Canada, we're seeing, you know, well 
well over $600 a year paid out of pocket by every single individual. So the argument would be that if the government is paying a lot, but individuals also are paying a very significant amount, none of these systems meets the definition of single payer. And that single payer would actually be a very radical system. You know, in, in other words, if it's so great, why is literally no other country in the world doing it? And this does two things. First of all, it lets you basically sever the link on the app anytime they try to point to the UK or Canada or Japan and say, look, they've got a better system. Your, your response would be, that's fine, but they're not a true single payer system. They're passing off you know, hundreds of dollars, in the case of a family, maybe even thousands of dollars every year in cost to the individual. So you labeling them as a single payer system is actually inaccurate. And the second thing you'd argue is that a system that truly did not pass any of the cost along to the individual would be ridiculously prohibitively expensive. First of all, the government would be paying more, right? You'd be paying more in terms of just, you know, tax revenues. But secondly, if you couldn't even have something like a copay, right? Maybe $25 every time you go to the doctor, that's going to drive use way up, right? The purpose of a copay and the purpose of making people pay a little bit, for example, for Luke's glasses that he got in the UK under the NHS is not really primarily because because that amount of the cost is necessary, it's to discourage people from making wasteful, excessive use of the healthcare system, just showing up every time they have like a slight tummy ache or something along those lines. If you don't have that, levels of use, wait times, cost are going to go up dramatically. So the argument here would be a true single payer system is kind of a unicorn, it's kind of an outlier, it's something that other countries don't really do, so number one, you can't link to the impacts from them, and number two, you're going to drive up wait times and costs. Right. That is a lot of really great information. Now, let's get into something that we kind of talked about earlier, but in a lot more detail, counter plans. Now, I know that this is Lincoln Douglas, it's not policy, so we're not gonna be running an actual counter plan, don't worry. These are just things that you can do as an alternative to trying to defend the status quo as the negative. So as a little bit about that, I'm gonna go into the different types of healthcare systems and their classifications. So let's start off with a universal system. So the first part of universal single payer healthcare system. So the universal system is a healthcare system where every individual has health coverage, like Brett said earlier. So this can be accomplished through government run health coverage systems or a private health insurance system or somewhat of a combination of the two. A hybrid system. Right, and as Brett said earlier, pretty much every system has some kind of a crossover between uh, public and private. So a single payer system is where the government or one entity is responsible for paying healthcare claims, using the money collected via the tax system or some other kind of method for collecting money such as copays. And the government in this system is the single payer. So when we say single payer, we're referring to one singular entity, in most situations a government. And it's a type of universal health care that's publicly administered and financed mainly by taxes. 71 countries have universal systems and 17 of those have single payer health care, which is a lot. Now, it might seem overwhelming at first, but don't worry, because this large number is actually a really good thing for the negative, because that means that you have a lot of flexibility when it comes to writing a counterplan-esque case. You have 54 you, universal systems that are not single-payer systems to choose from, right? Right, exactly. So you have lots of different options, so you can really weigh them all and compare them and contrast them with the affirmative plan. So really focus on outweighing the impacts and the benefits here when you're creating one of these kind of counter plan cases and really drive home the idea that a universal single payer system is not the only way and it certainly isn't always the best way. So. Here's some other options other than single payer that you could run with with the negative. So there are two basic ways that countries make healthcare affordable. It's either by mandating insurance or creating a system in which the government and insurance providers kind of work together hand in hand. But neither of these systems are actually always classified as universal single payer, but some of them are. So make sure to watch what you're doing and really stick to your definitions. But before you get too concerned with that and all up in the weeds with it, let me explain some some of the alternatives to you. So let's start off with the insurance mandate systems. That's where the government mandates that all citizens have to purchase health insurance from either private or public health insurers. And this often includes a requirement for the standard for a minimum coverage across all insurance. And also typically the government will subsidize low income individuals and forbids underwriting and for profit insurance, which means that these insurance companies, even if you do go with the private option 
aren't going to be able to bleed you dry like they do in the United States. And it's really a great alternative because it allows citizens to get quality health care for a lower price without the lack of financial freedom that could be found in the affirmative world. Yeah, and if you have these subsidies, and this is kind of similar to what the Affordable Care Act was supposed to do in the United States, right? So if you are a low-income individual, it might be that a system could be set up like this so that you're effectively completely subsidized by the government, something similar to Medicaid. But if you're someone who makes more than that, right, and you want to go out in the market and, and allow plans to compete, right, um, you know, you're not going to get subsidies from the government, but you'll have competition between different health care insurance providers, right, and you can pick the one that's best for you. So this would be what we sort of call like a public option, right? In other words, yes, in some instances, your lower income folks may need to have a publicly subsidized choice, but upper, if, if a person is happy with what's available from the private markets, and many people statistically are, there's plenty of evidence that people, there are many people in countries like Germany that want this, then why not give them the choice if they would prefer prefer to do it through a private market, right? Yeah, that's what I really like the most about this specific type of system is because it does give a lot of flexibility regardless of what your income bracket is. Another point that I have, just to kind of go ahead and shift gears, uh, is a more practical one, which is the idea that the transition to single payer will be disastrous. Uh, the idea here is that switching to true single payer is arguably the most draconian, polar, 180 degree shift that the U.S. could possibly do, going effectively from one extreme to the other. And I think it, it pairs nicely with basically any less extreme counter plan or alternative that you might run as a way of saying, look, the, the, the transition costs and the damage that will be done from this 180 degree switch to single payer from a more or less free market system are so bad that we should be defaulting very hard to preferring really any other solution, any more moderate model, even if it's a little bit less effective, even if it's not perfect, just because it's less of a massive shift. Why is that? Well, the reality is a single payer transition in the U.S. is that the whole system will basically have to be dis dismantled and will have to reconstitute itself, except that it won't be dismantled in some orderly way. It will basically collapse, right? Providers who can't get paid as much will close. Uh, wait times when they close will skyrocket, especially in poorer areas that are already underserved. Whole industries of people, millions of people who work in the private insurance industry and many providers' offices are just going to close up and millions of people will lose their jobs. It will be, in a word, in some ways catastrophic. And there's a piece on this by Olga Kazan in The Atlantic in 2017 about how the transition will be really bad. And what she writes is, the reason other countries have functional single-payer systems and we don't is that they created them decades ago. Strict government controls have kept their health care costs low since then, while we've allowed generous private insurance plans to drive up our health care costs. The UK can insure everyone for relatively cheap because British providers just don't charge as much for drugs and procedures. And so what she says is you can compare this trying to rein in costs like switching to single payer to seeing a truck, a massive truck going down the road at 75 miles an hour and then just suddenly slam on the brakes. For the first 10 to 20 years, it's predicted, the transition to single payer would be, quote, forget the language, but ugly as hell, right? Hospitals would shut down, waits for major procedures would extend from a few weeks to several months. She notes that Craig Garthway, a professor at the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern, predicts that if single payer did bring drug costs down, there might be less venture capital money chasing drug development, which might mean fewer blockbuster cures down the line. And yes, you would lose some hospitals for sure. So look, it's tempting for us as academic debaters in our ivory tower with no real consequences to sit back and say, well, you know, it'll all work itself out in the long run, eventually. And yeah, it probably will. But as the economist John Maynard Keynes once said, in the long run, we're all dead, right? It, it, it's fine to change up something like, you know, the way we say buy music online or something like that all at once. It might be confusing, but people will figure it out. But with something like healthcare, it, it's not like a sports car turning, right? It is essentially, a, as she says, a truck slamming on the brakes. It's something as massive and as critical as healthcare these transaction costs will be truly massive and they can't be hand waved away. And I would note that this also links to sort of the idea of what we call sometimes in policy, for our policy debater, the politics disad, right? The politics disadvantage. Uh, and the idea here is, is more or less a trade-off, right? So Kazan says that, that we're going to potentially have a major trade-off for Democrats on this. She says that under single payer, employers would stop covering part of their employees' insurance premiums and people would see their taxes rise. As people started to see it, they would get scared. Law professor Tim Jost said, and that's before you factor in how 
negatively, Republican groups would likely paint single payer in TV ads and congressional hearings, right? It would just be a very hard sell. He says, as someone who's very supportive of the Democratic Party, I hope Democrats don't decide to jump off the cliff of embracing single payer. So let's talk about how this politics trade-off argument works. If single payer is going to come into existence, I think we can agree, Luke, that it's going to be the Democrats who will pass it, right? Oh, definitely. I don't see any way that the Republicans would be able to do something like this. I mean, in fact, during the past, like we said earlier, with some of these kind of single payer esque uh, plans that have been passed in Congress, uh, the Democrats are really the ones pushing that, and the Republicans are the ones pushing back against that. So Republicans hate single-payer health care, and they, like, they're still actively trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So if Democrats pass it, they're going to own the fallout, right? Well, if the fallout is 20 years of chaos, hospitals closing down, or even a decade of chaos, hospitals closing down, wait times going up, taxes going up, and so on, Democrats are going to own that. And they're probably going to do significantly worse, as the card says, in national elections because they're going to be responsible for it. And we can be 100% certain Republicans are going to bang the drum about how single payer is terrible every day. So there's an argument, if you want to run the politics trade-off argument, that this would be very likely to keep Democrats and other progressives from being able to address really any other major issue. They would be in for a decade-long fight on this massive overhaul of the U.S. economy. They would be basically out of power because of the unpopularity here. So whatever other Democratic priority you think needs to be addressed, whether it's climate change, preventing voter disenfranchisement, LGBTQ rights, whatever whatever you know, you're interested in, right? Those things are going to be much, much less likely to come into play over the number of years that we're having this upheaval in the system where we're going from one extreme uh, to the other, right? So that's all we've got on the negative. So with that, we will do what we always do on the channel and move into some final thoughts. So, uh, really quickly, some final thoughts. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, at the beginning of the year, I almost always offer what I think is probably the same final thought to folks in case they're new to the channel or haven't seen it before, which is that on complex topics that are involved and involve a lot of math and data, it is always important for, for relatively new Lincoln-Douglas debaters, for all debaters really, to remember uh, the, the skill, uh, as we said earlier in the initial thoughts, of pulling back and giving the judge a simple, clear English language narrative of what is going on, right? It is so easy to get lost as a, as a high school debater, not, no offense, but I, I was one too, to get lost in the weeds of specific impacts and to get wrapped up in the particulars of your flow and to not, at the end of the round, give the judge what I would call a map out of the maze, right? You're, you're giving them specific impacts, but you're not telling them how to get to that critical point of marking the ballot for you. So whatever your approach, right, whether it is a purely utilitarian approach, whether it's something more about like Kantian ethics, something more about out, um, critical theory or something along those lines, no matter what you do, make sure that you're ready to tell a simple, coherent story at the end of the round as to what we're looking at. Yeah, and to kind of go off of what you said, Brett, I have two pieces of advice. One of them is be logical and prepared. And I know that we said earlier that you don't have to have any kind of specific plan, but that doesn't mean that you get to completely ignore policy on a very policy-heavy resolution. Make sure you know how your desired system works. So pick a system, pick a definition, and know it inside and out. And you also have to know what could or could not happen as a consequence of actually putting that system into place. So you can make arguments based on the fairness of a single pair system, but I have a feeling like most arguments this season are gonna come out of a resolution which are gonna be based on the consequences of passing such a particular policy. Now my other piece of advice is it's okay to focus on outcomes, kind of building off what I just said. There are a few options for purely ethic-based arguments. You can do that. But again, I predict that this is going to be a more utilitarian, consequentialist focused kind of debate. Because again, on so many of these ethics-based arguments, whether it's Rawls or Kant or whatever, there's no way to get to the ultimate ethical impact without spending a bunch of time talking about the practical reasons why single payer saves more lives and, and improves cost and things like that. Right, and that's another thing about costs. Don't be afraid of economic impacts. They have impacts on people's lives and they could certainly persuade judges. Now, utilitarian arguments could definitely be used on both sides of the topic. So I definitely encourage you to look at all of your options, whether you be debating on the affirmative or the negative. So with that, we wish you a fantastic first topic of the year. 
Uh, I know none of you are brand new to Lincoln Douglas, because if you were, you'd be doing the novice topic. Uh, but nonetheless, we hope you have a fantastic September and October. Uh, great time to be debating LD. Uh, glad to be back at in-person tournaments. Hope you have a lot of fun. So with that, we will say what we always say on this channel, which is remember, debate is for everybody. So work hard, have fun, and hail state.